story of the harp and a duck. If you are still writing, feel free to keep writing. That's absolutely okay. This is a story that starts about 5,000 years ago in Egypt. Egypt is a country in the northern part of Africa. And in Africa, and all sorts of other places, there are lots of mountains. And the mountains are important for this story. In this story, in the southern part of Egypt, there are big mountains. And in the winter, snow falls on those big mountains. And when the snow melts, it comes out of the mountains, as water does, and forms a river that flows to the Mediterranean. And you might have heard the name of this river before. This river is called the Nile River. It is a very big deal. And, and the reason that so many people lived in the area of Egypt way back 5,000 years ago is because the Nile River was there. Just think about those things that all humans need to survive. We need food and water and shelter and space, and then some more things for our brains. But those are the things your body needs. They had the water right here. And so people settled all around this area. People, 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 people. These are my people, though. <laughs> now, these people had a good life. They had water, they grew crops. This was after that Neolithic revolution that we talked about last week. Remember when people realized that seeds weren't just food? They had this power where if you planted them, they could make more food, way, way more food. So these people in Egypt grew a lot of crops. I'm gonna draw some little crops. And life was good. Every year they would harvest their crops and plant them again and harvest their crops and plant them again. But something happened with the Nile River every single year. And it is something that is happening with some of the rivers and streams around here right now. Every year in the early spring, when the snow started to melt, so much water would flow into the Nile River that it would overflow its banks. The Nile River would flood every single year. Not just once in a while, every year. And you would probably think, oh my goodness, why would they keep living there? That would be the worst thing ever. It flooded every year and they kept living by it? Well, it was not the worst thing ever. It was actually the best thing ever. Because every time the river flooded, when the water went back down, it left behind a bunch of nutrients. Remember that nutrients are the stuff in the soil that plants need to grow. Yeah. They use the power from the sun to photosynthesize, but they use the nutrients to help keep themselves healthy, kind of like you use vitamins to help keep yourself healthy. If you keep planting the same crop over and over, it uses up the nutrients of the soil, and you have to do things like use fertilizers or put dead fish down with your seeds or all sorts of other wild things. But the people in Egypt didn't have to do any of that because every single year when the river flooded, it brought tons of new nutrients. And so all their fields would be nice and full of brand new nutrients and ready to plant new crops, and it was perfect. You might think the story is over, but it's not. Because there's a big problem. Let's imagine our good Egyptian friend Bob lives here. And Bob has this lovely field that is all of his. And next to him, we have our another Egyptian friend, Sam. These are not good Egyptian names. But in my story, they will be Bob and Sam. Maybe next time I tell this story, I will find some good Egyptian names to use. But let's say Bob and Sam live here. And they've got their little fence. Well, unfortunately, the flood is coming. And it's going to wipe out their fence. And when the floodwaters come back down, and our dear friends Bob and Sam are ready to plant their new crops, they're going to be left standing here. And Bob might say to Sam, The line is right here, Sam. And Sam might say to Bob, The line is up here, Bob. And there's no way for them to keep track of it, because if they leave little sticks to mark it like a fence, they're going to get washed away by the flood every year. And so, we have an important job. We have an important job that was considered literally one of the most important things a person could do with their life in Egypt during this time. And that job was 
was to be a Parthenodopta. Parthenodopta is a nice giant word. You can practice spelling it, impress people. But what it means in Greek, the language that it got its name from, is rope stretcher. You may notice I have some ropes. Parthenodoptra were a group of men. Yes, only men, because unfortunately this story happens back in the day and in a place where women didn't get as much respect. These men had figured out a trick. They figured out that with their special ropes, they could make a right angle. A right angle is like this. It's a 90 degree corner. It's what you see on the edge of a book. It's what you see on the edge of almost everything. A shelf, the roof, a door. And if they could get a right angle, let's make our little river. If they could get a perfect right angle here, then they could tell you from one of those where everyone else's field was. They were worried, because look, if they drew an acute angle, Bob's field would be tiny. And if they drew an obtuse angle, remember that's the big ones, Bob's field would be massive and Sam would be kind of cross. So they knew that they needed to draw a right angle straight out from the side of the river. And the way they did that was using their rope. Now, these guys, the harp and adopta, they didn't do the really hard work. They figured it out and they stood around and said, go this way, go this way, go this way. But the actual hard work of hauling the big giant heavy rock rope through the very, very muddy fields was work that was done by the enslaved people that the Egyptians had. Because in Egypt during that time, it was considered okay to have enslaved people. We know that's not okay now, but they did it back then. So they would have their people do this work. And the work went like this. They had a big, long rope. Theirs was much larger. I'm going to use a little one. And the rope had knots tied in it at equal intervals. See? That means that from one knot to the next, is always the same distance. It's like a measuring tool. You could use rulers or yardsticks if you wanted to do this work now. But they had it really huge. They would lay down their rope and count. One, two, three knots. And then they would turn. And they would count. One, two, three, four knots. And then they would turn and connect back to where it was before, which was exactly five knots. It made a beautiful, lovely, as long as their rope didn't twist, triangle. And that triangle would always, 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 always be a right angled triangle. If you imagine that the edge of our pentagon, the blue line right here, is the edge of the river, look, we could get a perfectly straight line. Bob could get his field over here, Sam could get his field over here, everyone could start planting, and the world would be really dead. Until the next flood came, wiped out everything. And that spring, again, the harp and adopta, and the enslaved people that they were actually making do the work, would come out with their fancy string, stretch their rope, and mark the fields again. And this, we sometimes like to think of, as the start of geometry, the start of the study of geometry, which is the study of shapes. Because they discovered that if you make a triangle with one side that is three somethings long, three feet, three inches, three centimeters, three meters, three miles, whatever they are, three in one direction and four in the next and five on this side, it will always give you a right angle, every single time. Some people sat down and decided to get creative and found other combinations. If you have a triangle that is six and eight and 10, it will also make a right angle. If you have a triangle that is nine and 12 and 15, it will also give you a right angle. When we're done, that might be a way you want to follow up. Maybe you want to find some more ways. Maybe you'd like to see if you can figure out how to spell Parpenodopta with your eyes closed.
Maybe you'd like to draw a sketch of the people on the Nile River. Maybe you'd like to look up Egyptian names and tell me, hey, Katie, next time instead of Bob and Sam, here are some good Egyptian names. You can choose how you'd like to follow up, but you should find some way to follow up.